Just outside of Moab, Utah, you can walk up a little hill into the Jurassic. Now the great old dinosaurs of flesh and bone are no longer here, but their ghosts still haunt these outcrops in the form of giant tracks they left in the rippling sandstone of what was once a sandbar in a Jurassic River. In 2015, I was commissioned by Utah Bureau of Land Management paleontologist Rebecca Hunt Foster to create an illustrated interpretive panel to show visitors to this public fossil site what it might have looked like when these tracks were made and what animals might have made them. In part one of this two-part series on Copper Ridge, I'm going to discuss reconstructing the animal which made the most prominent tracks at the site. These huge, deep tracks, which go up the side of the sandbar and then turn to the right. While the ripples in the sandstone tell us that this was sand deposited by an ancient river, determining exactly which dinosaurs left their footprints here was no easy task, because this river and the sand it deposited were part of a much larger geologic system called the Morrison Formation which was a late Jurassic depositional environment that covered much of Western North America and which was teeming with dinosaurs. The skeletal evidence from the Morrison Formation tells us that these huge tracks left by a four-legged animal had to have been made by a sauropod. The sauropods were those huge long-necked dinosaurs, but determining exactly which kind of sauropod made these tracks is difficult because we know from the skeletal evidence that multiple lineages of sauropods lived alongside each other in the Morrison ecosystem. In order to come up with a best guess as to which sauropod type might have left these tracks, I traveled with paleontologist and sauropod expert Matt Wadle to the site to get his interpretation. So we're at Copper Ridge, we're walking out the possible Camarasaur track way. Here's a semicircular punch out that looks like a good fit for maybe a manis track uh, which would have been left no right then left we come here it looks like a pez and i might be on top of another pez, pez right here and then a manis manis and pez pair then we go right here and there's a pez and maybe possibly they combine maybe there a bit of manis there or the pez might have overprinted the manis then pez here with possible manis with possible manis then Pez here, Strong I Pez. don't really see anything that looks like a Manus. Might even be the Manus up there for this Pez. Uh, that's a pretty wide split. They don't usually come that far apart. Okay. Well, I don't know. I'd be more inclined to think that this is the Pez and this is, oh, but that Manus is usually outside, not inside. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's the Manus help pushing to turn. So maybe it is the right Manus. Then we go Pez here. And, and again, maybe, it's like maybe, maybe the Manus is Manus slipping down here. into it. Well, the Manus track would come first, then the Pez track would come and stop. more Oh, okay, okay, yeah. We've got Pez here, and what looks like a shallow deformation in a semicircle, consistent with the Manus track here. That was a left, and then a final right there. Okay. With possibly some Manus destruction up there. Oh, yeah, there's this little rim. There's a little thing. Yeah, um, that The main thing good. to me that's interesting is the relative depths of the Manus and Pez prints. We're not seeing the Manus prints being anywhere near as deep as the Pez prints. And I know even Camarasaurus probably created a little more weight on its hind feet than its forefeet, but not like this. This kind of offset, that which you'd expect to see in a diplodocid. What Matt means is that of the two most likely groups that could have made these tracks, he favors the hypothesis that it was a diplodocid. Because the diplodocids have a slightly different body plan than the Camarasaurus and the Brachiosaurus. The Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus have longer front legs, which means that probably more of the weight from the front of their body, their, their chest and their neck, was directed down into those columnar front legs than the diplodocids, which actually had longer back legs than front legs, and this huge tail, which would have counterbalanced the front of the body with the tall hips of the back legs as kind of the, the teeter-totter point for the whole animal. Matt's area of expertise is anatomy, and one of the things that studying the anatomy of modern animals has taught us is that reptiles and birds have this big muscle running from the undersides of their tail to the back of their femurs. This muscle is called the M. caudofemoralis longus, and reptiles with big tails have big M. caudofemoralis longus muscles, which can pull back on their femurs with a lot of force. 
In the case of Diplodocids, their tails are extreme badonkadonk level, giganto tails, and their M. femoralis longus muscles would have been huge, powerful muscles that could have pulled back on their femur with massive force. Matt favors the hypothesis that all these anatomical features taken together indicate that diplodocids were specially adapted for rearing up to reach high into the trees to forage for food. Which makes sense if you're a huge animal with massive nutritional needs competing for food in an environment with other huge animals with massive nutritional needs. So Rebecca and I decided that the best animal for our illustration would be Diplodocus. Its bones are found in this layer of the Morrison Formation, and the skeleton shows us it was a strange and beautiful animal. But what should the rest of it look like? Well, there are some small skin impressions from diplodocid sauropods that tell us that at least little sections of them were scaly. But what color should they be? Well, for over 200 years, sauropod dinosaurs have generally been reconstructed as big, gray, or beige, vaguely elephant-like creatures standing usually alone on a flat landscape with a couple of monkey puzzle trees in the background. Now, some people have argued that, well, sauropods shouldn't be strikingly colored animals because large-bodied animals aren't usually strikingly colored. And that sort of holds true with some mammals. Yet we now know that the one branch of the dinosaur family tree that's still alive is modern birds. But since we've been looking at large-bodied mammals for our sauropod reconstruction ideas, I gotta ask, why have we been overlooking this large-bodied, long-necked, tree-browsing mammal that's incredibly strikingly marked? In fact, it's well known that giraffes' coloration serves important biological functions. In young giraffes, it may serve as an outline-disrupting camouflage when they hide in dense undergrowth. Out in the open, however, they are really easy to spot from a long ways away, especially if you're, say, the height of a giraffe. So this coloration almost certainly helps with species recognition. There's also some evidence to suggest that these high contrast, dark and light spots may help with thermal regulation. And in adult males, the spots actually darken as they age, which may communicate important things like maturity, dominance, and overall fitness to potential mates. In other words, this is a large-bodied mammal using coloration as much as it possibly can, and it's colorblind. Very much unlike sauropod dinosaurs, much closer living relatives, modern birds, the vast majority of which are far from colorblind. In fact, most daytime active species of birds can see more colors than we primates can. Thus, it naturally follows that visual display is of huge importance to living dinosaurs. So considering that birds as a group can be both wildly innovative with their soft tissue displays, many of which leave very little evidence in their skeleton, by the way, and they can be incredibly ridiculously colored, especially when you have multiple closely related species living in the same environment, I can't help but wonder if perhaps the sauropod dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation would have reminded us more of flocks of giant tropical birds than the beige lumbering behemoths that they're so often reconstructed as. Unfortunately, we'll probably never know all of what any sauropod dinosaur really looked like when it was alive. But what we do know, even just from this site, is amazing. That once upon an unfathomably long time ago, a huge four-legged animal, truly unlike anything any of us have seen alive today, walked up a beautiful rippling sandbar and made a right hand turn in just the perfect spot that its prints would be preserved to tell that little piece of its life story 150 million years later. This illustration and another illustration from one of the other trackways, which will be the subject of my next video, are done and the interpretive panel will soon be installed at the site. So if you're in the Moab area, I hope you'll swing by and check it out. It's an awesome site and you can really feel the presence and the movement of these animals. 
Now, if you can't get out to Moab, but you still want to see my art in person, well, you're in luck. There is another way. I am selling poster prints of both of the Copper Ridge illustrations on my website, don'tmesswithdinosaurs.com. You can also support my original paleo art by making a small pledge on my Patreon page. I'm only asking for a buck a month and it gets you access to a whole bunch of other behind the scenes and bonus content and early looks of my upcoming projects. So I hope you'll check that out too. Thanks for watching. And if you find yourself out exploring any good old outcrops, I hope you'll keep an eye out for living dinosaurs and the ghosts of ancient giants.